Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm a little bit annoyed because Chris kind of nicked my line about David Cameron uh, uh, being here just uh, just last week. So uh, obviously, we, we only have the very best uh, of speakers sitting on this particular spot, and we feel the hand of history on us as we uh, as we talk about the uh, developments in uh, financial services uh, and financial technology uh, here in uh, here, here at this conference. Um, so this is part two, basically, of uh, this evening's uh, activities uh, of the CEO agenda. This panel uh, debate entitled, uh, Welcome to the Fintech Revolution. So, welcome to all of you. Uh, and joining me, I'm going to ask our panelists to come up uh, onto the stage uh, one by one. So, first of all, we've got Chris, who's uh, sat over there. Um, you've just heard from him, uh, so he literally doesn't need an introduction. So, I'm not going to give him one because you already have it. Uh, next, we've got uh, Debu uh, Pakasta. He's the new business development principal at Google. Uh, he's an operator and a deal maker, spearheading the acquisitions of uh, Beat That Quote and uh, ITA Software, to name but two. And in a previous life, he helped sell lastminute.com to Sabre. So thanks for joining us this evening, Debu. Uh, next up, we have got, uh, well, we've got Will Jones. He's the managing director for Mon Monetize in Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. Uh, Monetize helps bring banking into the smartphone era. They've got uh, 300 banks as their clients around the world uh, as uh, customers. And if you're wondering uh, where the chief executive of Monetize is, because he was originally listed as speaking here, uh, he had to jump on a plane to the States. So uh, perhaps there'll be up to 301 uh, clients uh, when he comes back. Uh, next, we've got uh, John uh, Conlon. He's of uh, Barclay Card. He's one of their top people in the uh, digital payment uh, systems arena. Uh, he helped bring us uh, mobile contactless uh, together with Orange. And uh, he's now working on a range of mobile payment propositions. Uh, we're going to try and get him to tell us about some of them, but uh, some of them he presumably won't be telling us uh, uh, for reasons of uh, trade secrets. Um, now, at Barclay Card, he almost overlapped uh, with our final panelist, uh, which is James uh, LeBrock, but James actually left a little bit before then. Um, James uh, left Barclay Card in 2010, is it? Uh, to become the, 2006, I beg your pardon, uh, to become the uh, managing director of uh, O2 Money, which allows uh, the network's 22 million subscribers uh, to pay for things on their mobile phone uh, without having to get their wallet out. So if you'd like to welcome our panelists and uh, we'll get the discussion going. Um, so, I mean, I suppose we should start off from where uh, Chris left it, really, which is uh, about mobile being uh, an irrelevance and it all being about the data, if I understood you correctly. Uh, now, uh, I mean, right now, I mean, is, is this really... I remember when I was 13 years old, I was going out with a girl, and she was a brosette, and, and they didn't last very long brosettes. Uh, is this really just a teenage crush that we've got on, on mobile uh, financial technology uh, developments that are going on right now? Is, is Chris right in terms of... Uh, it all being about the data and mobile just being, I don't know, like a, a bit of a fad. Deb, if we start with you. Sure. Um, Mic on. Yeah. So I partially agree, and I'd say partially for a different reason. I've seen what M-Pesa does. And I, in fact, last time when I was in Kenya, it's probably when you see the mobile use case, and I'll define mobile as a use case at first, and that's where the power lies. You see what M-Pesa is doing to Kenya itself. You know, people pay their rents on M-Pesa. It's something I've never seen anywhere else. You can actually pay your rent. And I actually, I didn't believe it. So I had one of my colleagues saying, you know, do you want me to show you how it works? And he actually took out his phone and he paid his month's rent while we were talking. Wouldn't a lot of us like it? Coming back to mobile, it's the fundamental use case that makes it very powerful. It's even more powerful in countries where, you know, landline telephony is increasingly relevant. And I come out of India. India, the growth of mobile has basically meant a lot of people don't own landmines, in effect. So the use case becomes more powerful as that grows. Mobile also becomes very useful when you're thinking about agriculture, for obvious reasons. India, Indonesia, very good use cases where financial information that's getting disseminated through mobile, which is a use case, becomes very powerful. Where I also agree is that, and this is Chris's, I think, broad point, Data. data is fundamentally where the game is being played. Mobile is a use case on which data is getting disseminated. And so I agree from that particular perspective, which is correct. And you've got to look at both together. But the use case is important, because if you don't have a use case, then consumer adoption becomes a problem. We all adopt something that we know that we are using. The use case has to be relevant. If it's relevant, then you know it goes viral. If it goes viral, it's a real business case that builds on top of it. So I, sp I suppose right now, obviously, mobile is, is what we're using rather than 
you know, tapping onto a wall or using our shoelaces or our shoelaces automatically buying a replacement for themselves, whatever they might, might do. I mean, well, wh where do you see things uh, going from here? I think, I think to me the most important thing we're seeing right out in the market now is what consumers are actually doing with mobile. Um, you know, it, it would probably in many ways, if you had a consumer panel here of two, three hundred people, you'd get an interesting perspective. But what we're saying is if you present the consumer with something which is very easy to access and use, uh, is secure, uh, and has trust around it as well in respect of the brand offering the proposition, uh, consumers flock to it. Uh, th I was telling, uh, I think, one of my colleagues here earlier that uh, this reminds me, looking back to 1997 and the internet revolution just kicking in, uh, this is like internet on steroids. It's actually absolutely going at a pace and a speed uh, which has been not seen by banks before. A completely kind of different behavior uh, as people uh, are no longer having to think about money management in the respect of I need to put two hours to one side and I'll never do it. They're actually snacking on their money management. They're actually uh, looking at it for five, ten minutes in the morning at half past six, the new peaks that actually come in as they travel into work on the train. This is kind of the power of mobile and the engagement that mobile is actually having. Engagement levels of a, a good banking application are five, six times greater than internet usage. And that's very, very powerful. And John, do you, do you see this as an opportunity or a threat for someone like Barclay Card, which has obviously been around for many years, uh, which perhaps some people might see as an old form of, of payments, kind of trying to get to grips with the new? Uh, it's a huge opportunity. So I think to, to the point of the Internet of Things, love the concept, and I think we'll get there. I, I'm kind of more in the, in, in the kind of, of where we're how people live their lives today. So mo mobility is more important than mobile. So the fact that it's about a device, it's about that people can do what they want where they want. So you know, we live in an on-demand uh, lifestyle. We want things that we want. We want to consume media or consume content or consume information or banking information, whatever it might be. But for a business like Barclay Card, if we don't uh, embrace it, then we'll be left behind. You know, we're, we're very real to that fact that people use mobility to live their lives. They expect to be able to get access to information securely when they want and where they want to. So from an opportunity perspective, it's a huge opportunity for us. And we've, we've already launched a few mobile services. And, and there's, great, there's great feedback on that. The, the ask is more. Consumers are, uh, consumers are asking for more. And, and they want to be able to get it where they want it, as opposed to us pushing it to them. And I suppose in a few years' time, if, if plastic uh, uh, becomes a thing of the past, you'll just change your name to Barclay Chip or Barclay something. <laughs> That's a pass. In the air or something or other. Yeah. Uh, I mean, James, you, you used to work at Barclay Card. You're now uh, at, uh, at O2. I mean, a few years ago, I mean, mobile phones were just for making calls. They were just for texting. OK, they were to go on. I mean, now you're moving kind of onto Barclay Card's territory. You're moving into kind of bank's territory as well in a, in a way uh, are, the, are you all kind of are you all helping each other to kind of develop this is this a turf war or or is now just the calm before the storm Where, how, how's this going to play out my view is that we're right at the beginning um, and so what we're seeing is lots and lots of activity from all sorts of different players that over time will uh, will learn the lesson that collaboration is really important We'll learn the lesson that alliances and partnerships with the right organizations are the way actually to achieve success. So people comment, and, uh, comment on a, a war of wallets. I, I think it's, it's not a war of wallets at the moment. There's just a proliferation of different opportunities. Um, you know, Chris talked about the fact that, that it's not about mobile. It's, not, it's about connectivity, actually. Uh, and I think the Internet of Things is about connectivity, connecting people with uh, the things and the, and the experiences that they want to have. And that's what I'd say we try to do. So I'm not trying to put my tank on John's lawn. Um, I'm actually trying to connect our customers with the things they want to do. Of course, once uh, Google Wallet comes over here to Europe, perhaps, uh, perhaps there'll be more than one or two tanks on, on the lawns over here. I, I know Deborah was waiting for someone to ask uh, when it's coming to Europe, so I'll just get it out of the way now. Can you tell us when Google Wallet's coming here to Europe? So as of now, we are uh, concentrating with Google Wallet in the US. That's fundamentally the market that we're spending a lot of our time and energy on. We want to make sure that the product you know, is developed into a, a more robust version out there as we go through this. Obviously, Europe is an obvious market, given the nature of how it's federated today. And I use the word federated specifically. But for the time being, what we're doing is we're getting the product fine-tuned in the US, and then in due course, it comes out in Europe. And Chris, you were talking about this uh, bank, uh, that Fido, Fido Bank, is that right? Fido. That uh, Because you were saying, relating to the trust that perhaps people have lost in traditional banks, 
I, I mean, we're seeing a lot of disruption from, I suppose Google's like an established player, so like Barclay Card's an established player in their own particular markets, moving in more and more into this uh, fintech arena. But are they going to be seen as kind of dinosaurs, if you like, when the likes of Fido and others come along and completely disrupt the whole financial system themselves? I suppose some already are. That you know, Google is the incumbent, Facebook is the upstart. But Facebook's now the incumbent. There'll be something else very soon that will be the upstart. Um, PayPal was the innovator, but now they're the incumbent because Square is the upstart. But up, Square as an upstart is already becoming an incumbent, so there'll be something else downstream. Right. And I think reflecting on what the panelists' response to the mobile is dead discussion or mobile is not the focal point, it's the connectivity, which is absolutely right. It's to do with, um, I spent all my life looking at technology that's coming downstream, and by the time it arrives, I'm actually bored with it because I've been dealing with it for so long. So I've been dealing with mobile since about 1995, 96, um, where we were doing mobile payments, WAP-based banking, all that sort of stuff. And so it's taken a long time to get mainstream, but then when it does become mainstream, we all go, where did that come from? A bit like the iPod when that became mainstream. Where did that come from? Well, it was pretty obvious that it was coming because there were MP3 players, but I remember going into a store called Dixon's, which some of you may remember, um, in 2003 and said, I would like an MP3 player. And they said, we don't stock those anymore. We used to. And I said, well, why don't you stock them? They said, because people don't download music off the internet. It's too slow. And they didn't see the revolution coming. Obviously, now we all see it. Uh, a bit like the iPhone when it came out. It's absolutely obvious now, but it takes the innovator to bring the technologies together and make them mainstream before we say that is so blindingly obvious. And right now, what's blindingly obvious to me is that we will move very rapidly from the mobile focal point to this connectivity point. If you look at the CES show this year, the Consumer Electronics Show, one of the most exciting products for me that came out of it was a light bulb. But, uh, you, yeah, you saw it. A light bulb that um, basically is a wireless Wi-Fi speaker system with surround sound 5.1, or 5.2 rather. So it's just a normal light bulb, but it's on a Wi-Fi Bluetooth connectivity into your sound system or into your TV, which to me means I move away from wired speakers into wireless everywhere through the house. It's pretty boring stuff, but that's the Internet of Things coming to life. That is, as we're starting to see it coming through. And as we see it coming through, suddenly we'll see mainstream products within five years, and we go, where did that come from? And that's why I focus on that, because I'd rather be positioning for five years from now rather than launching a mobile service for 2014 and finding it's completely irrelevant. Uh, I should say that um, to all of our uh, guests here today, uh, if any of you have got any questions, uh, we'll be opening up to the floor uh, in, in a few minutes. So uh, when you've got a question, just uh, put your hand up and say who you are, and someone's going to be roving around with, with a couple of microphones. Uh, but just moving on from that, uh, Chris, and I just had a marvelous vision of someone having to change that light bulb. I'm not quite sure kind of if it gets hot or, or what happens or if it's a particularly expensive light bulb to change. Uh, but in terms of the, uh, in terms of, I mean, again, just going back to your point about the, this new bank, I mean, we've got representatives yep. uh, from who, who have banks as their uh, customers or who, who work for, for banks themselves. I mean, in a few years' time, are we going to just see the likes of market invoice or funding circle? I mean, are banks actually going to be needed in a few years' time yes. when you can already get your money uh, from these kind of uh, social funding uh, places, which, again, a few years ago just didn't exist? Uh, Debu. So let me, let me answer that in a very different way. So I'm going to throw some names, and, and I'm not going to explain what these companies do. But at your leisure, just, just search them, and you'll get a sense of where people are playing around in this particular space. Ironically, a lot of them are actually non-European. So, but another bank, Move-In Bank, if you have a look, yep. very interesting what they're trying to achieve. Finance a car, very different business model, but trying to achieve something else. You look at people like eToro, social investing, which is basically a lot of people talk about that. You look at Currency Cloud, you know, one of the fundamental big businesses that there is, the one that is almost ready to be taken over at a pure technological level. By is, Google, maybe? No, no, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's not, it's, it's a completely different business. It's a much more for banking business. Blue Leaf, these are players who are fundamentally tr innovating in this particular space. When you look at what they're trying to do, they're taking highly established businesses and trying to turn them around. They're doing it in a very small, but you know, as, as Chris will explain, you know, they're trying to go at the core of what the value proposition is and then trying to turn that around from the user's perspective. Because in the financial services sector, what's typically happened is you know, you've been told, you've been given something, and you've then gone and consumed that. 
what if I start demanding the other way around? I tell you what product I want, and I then accordingly have a product that's being created for me, and then that scales up. Ultimately, our needs from a financial service, and I'm gonna to stick to financial services for the time being, our needs are not that different. However, our use cases and our timings are very, very different. And that's where a lot of the games will play. Now, are banks gonna remain? I think for the near future, absolutely. Because, you know, and for various reasons, without going into where regulation obviously is one, but also use cases are there. What a bank will look like is a different issue. I suppose the other issue, um, Will, is of course that they might not show it necessarily on the outside, but they're pretty technologically advanced in a lot of cases. I mean, I was chatting to you on the phone earlier and say I just stumbled upon the fact that I could check my balance with HSBC on my, on my smartphone. They never told me that I could do that. Well, yeah. Why are they hide? They, 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 they're obviously capable of doing a lot more than they're actually doing. Yeah. I mean, are they in the vanguard of technology, or are they, are they you know, going to find themselves in the place where perhaps Dixon's found themselves, or, or Comet, or HMV, to, to use more extreme examples? I, I think it, that's a great point. It, it all comes down to how quickly are they moving, and whether they're actually being visionary in the space. Uh, so, yeah, HSBC is an example. I think a very good example is what RBS and NatWest have done as well. Uh, they, you know, publicly known, they, they have 2.7 million customers now using mobile as an exclusive relationship with the banks. That's 20% of their retail customer base in the UK is choosing and electing to make mobile their mechanism for interfacing with their bank. And that's probably over an 18-month period. It's grown to that level. Now, why is that? Uh, I think, A, it shows that actually you don't have to have necessarily a brand <laughs> new brand or a brand new bank, in that case a bank who obviously, like many banks, had challenges in 2008, who've actually got the vision to actually rebound in a different way, structured their business in a way which allowed them to move quickly, and actually then gave the customer what they want. Uh, and I think the question around will, will the banks be around in X year's time will largely come down to what does the consumer want, where will the consumer be happy to mandate their monthly salary, and which relationships will they trust, be secure enough, and are willing to give them what they want as well quickly enough to do that. And again, of course, that comes down to trust. Um, I mean, John, uh, <coughs> banks, I, I remember actually reading that the bankers, uh, politicians, and journalists are equally reviled in this country. Um, so, uh, so it's nice to, uh, to, 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 to be sharing the pain with, uh, with some people here. <laughs> but, but, in, in, but, but talking seriously for a moment, as a bank, you, know, you have the trust in the sense that people are used to having their salary deposited there, they're used to you know, using you to look after their most important assets. But can it also be a liability in that you're, no, I'm not going to use Barclays as a spe specific example, but that banks aren't necessarily everyone's favorite institution, and perhaps this is something else that is, is holding back bank's potential in this, in this arena? Well, I think that <clears throat> the potential is held back if there's complacency. So the, there's, a real, there's a realization that, uh, certainly in, in Barclay Card, that our competitors in three years, one, two years, three and five years' time aren't the same competitors as we faced the last 10 years. So as a payments business, we, you know, they have many more um, um, competitors who enter the fray because it's easier to enter. Uh, and to Will's point, consumers will demand what and, and take on services that they choose. So it could be that O2 Money might finance uh, my part of my wallet if I want to as opposed to just assuming it's a bank. So uh, complacency will, um, well, could put a bank out of our space. Uh, so I think what, what we're focusing on is trying to understand how the, the payment instrument plays a part in, in consumers' lives. And, and payments, if we're, if we're very honest, payments isn't that interesting. You know, it just has to work. It, a customer wants it to, to, be, to work, to be trusted, and just, just to happen. Uh, so if we focus on payments, we won't uh, win in, in, in this wallet space. So the, I think the, the complacency moves away if you create a service that people actually genuinely want to uh, use. And it covers more than just the payment aspect. So the, the, the point around this war of wallets, it, again, I don't agree that it's a war, but I think what will come down to the, the winning services will be those that offer more than just a payment opportunity. So complacency and choice. Uh, really come to it. And James, I mean, is this, you know, for O2 money, I mean, is that, people, people, I suppose people would be happy to, you know, buy whatever they want, their newspaper or, you know, maybe a CD if there's a shop that's still open selling CDs. Uh, but may, they're not, probably not going to use O2 money to maybe buy a car or, you know, to, to, to put a deposit down on a house. Uh, I, I don't see why not. Um, I don't think they will in the next few weeks. But I, th I think the point, and building on John's comment, um, I don't wake up in the morning wanting to make a payment. I don't wake up in the morning wanting to borrow money to buy a house, to buy a car. I don't wake up in the morning thinking that's the very best savings rate. Um, th 
financial services products, and, and I've been a banker for 26 years, so I can, I can make some of the comments I'm about to make, they're about a derived demand. The truth is that I want to buy a house and I might need finance. I want to buy my sandwich and I need a means to pay for it. But that doesn't have to have anything to do with, with a traditional bank. So I think what's happening with innovation these days is that it's, it's a much more accessible opportunity and it's a much more sophisticated opportunity. And so the organizations Debu listed are organizations that are looking, to use his term, at the use case. They're looking at what it is the consumer wants to do and they're reinventing the way in which it's done. I mean, the list, is, it's endless, isn't it? Borrow, wonga, I mean, it just continues. So I think bank banks have got to find um, a way of innovating differently that presents the services they can offer to the consumers in a way that solves the consumer's problem or desire in a much easier, friendlier, accessible way. And Chris, I'm not, I wasn't a particular fan of Star Trek myself, but I think we used to talk about there being life, but not as we know it. Are we going to have banks, but not as we know them right now? Is that, is that how it's going to be? Well, there's a number of things that will interplay into this discussion because um, you know, back in the day, uh, I always remember when in 1996 Virgin announced they're getting into banking, Tesco, Sainsbury were getting into banking, uh, and everyone thought that Microsoft would get into banking. And 15 years later, Tesco is still trying to get into banking. Virgin has just about got into banking through rebranding another bank. Um, and part of that is the challenge of getting into banking, it's the core of banking itself, which is if you're opening a bank, particularly in Britain uh, or Europe, you have to back it with £100,000 of guarantee per person who's, who's banking with you. That means if you've got 1,000 customers, you've got to have £100 million of capital that you can prove you have, and if you get 2,000 customers, 200 million and upwards. So that's a big challenge. Uh, there's a huge vetting process to get a banking license about your board of directors and who's on that board, because banks are meant to be safe, and we've gone through a time where they haven't been, but the whole regulatory regime means that most companies don't get into the core of banking because it's just not <coughs> worth it. You know, they'd rather ride on the above the banking space, which is what PayPal do. But th there are a number of people now coming in who are doing different business models, um, I know Mervyn very well, but you know, people like Zopa who are here this evening, um, funding circles being mentioned, Kickstarter, uh, even LinkedIn you know, to get crowdfunding. There's lots of other ways to crowdfund, to source investment to, to save. There's a great uh, company in the States called Smarty Pig, social saving. Um, but it's on the periphery, it's not at the core. And so the second thing that comes in is that even if you get a license to do banking in, in the UK or America or anywhere else at the core, um, then you take deposits. And you have another problem then, which is that um, basically uh, you've got to be able to run those accounts in the UK in particular for free. At the moment? At the moment. So the only way you can make any money uh, on those ac accounts is to stiff people, sorry, charge people um, fees <laughs> on defaults or on other services. And for anyone who wants to get into banking, therefore, you have this hurdle of all the cash capital investment you've got to build up to get into the core of banking. Then you get into the core of banking, there's no money there. So that's the reason why 16 years since Virgin, Tesco um, you know, and others, Microsoft have been rumoured to come into banking, they haven't because it's not worth it. I suppose there's also obviously all the regulatory questions about you know, people getting into this arena to be regulated to make sure that they, they can be trusted. I want to um, open up to uh, the floor if anyone's got a question.